Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Briz Science, the free public lecture series of science where we bring you not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research with Brisbane. This series is, of course, brought to you by the University of Queensland and hosted here at The Edge, part of the State Library of Brisbane, our wonderful long-term venue partners. I am your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore, and I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. Tonight's talk, we are I'm going to get into the details for a moment. We have a double act for you tonight, not one, but two researchers. And they're going to give their presentations, after which we'll have the opportunity for some questions, and then we will have food and drink outside and the chance to interrogate them further. We take questions either on those question slips you hopefully picked up on the way in, or on Twitter, with hashtag BrizScience. And we will be live tweeting throughout the evening, so feel free to get on there and drop us a line. Um, just please, if you could put your phone on silent now, that would be fantastic. Oh, there's a lot of people going for their phones. Like, oh yeah, okay, great, marvellous. So tonight we are talking about superbugs, not Spider-Man or Ant-Man, but, thank you for laughing, appreciate that, uh, but bacteria that have developed a resistance to some or all antibiotics, meaning we could return to a world where a simple cut or a hospital visit or let alone major surgery could become life-threatening like it was 50 or 100 years ago. Fortunately, we have our best people on the job coming up with solutions and they're taking parallel but different paths to find an answer. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Mark Blaskovich, who is an antibiotic hunter, uh, a little bit like Pokemon, except you don't want to catch them all, um, at, based at the Centre for Superbug Solutions, the Institute for Molecular Bioscience out at UQ. He was originally an industrial drug developer, but is now developing new antibiotics, as well as investigating the use of modified antibiotics to detect bacterial infections. So to kick us off tonight, could you please put your hands together for Dr. Mark Blaskovich. Well, thanks very much for the, the opportunity to speak here tonight and thank all of you for coming out to see us. So I'm gonna be talking about the problem of antibiotic discovery and why we can't find antibiotics anymore. And get that to work. So you may have noticed in the last decade or so a lot of headlines talking about superbugs and the rise of antibiotic resistance. But some of the headlines are quite sensationalist. So favorite up here is the mop of death. You've got killer superbugs. But they do reflect a reality, as pointed out by the World Health Organization, that the world is heading towards a post-antibiotic era or a pre-antibiotic era where simple infections can kill you again. And before antibiotics were discovered, about 40% of deaths were caused by infections. So the threat of antimicrobial resistance is developing. Predictions are that by 2050, there'll be more than 10 million deaths a year caused by infections, by drug-resistant infections. And that's more than the currently uh, dying in the worldwide from, from cancer. So the threat is real if we don't start to do something now. The problem with antibiotic resistance is that it affects more than what you might think of just normal infections. It has an impact on a lot of the medical procedures that we now take for granted. So things like hip replacements, um, transplants, even anti-cancer therapy all rely on having effective antibiotics to work. So if we don't have effective antibiotics, all those other medical treatments will no longer work and people will die from the other illnesses as well. There's an economic impact as well. Um, the, the estimate, again, by 2050, if we don't do anything, there will be about a 3.5% effect on the GDP, which is more than caused the, the past global financial crisis. So one thing I just want to clear up before we go any further, when we talk about antibiotic resistance, we're talking about the bacteria becoming resistant to the antibiotic. So the antibiotic can no longer kill the bacteria. It's not that the body or the human becomes resistant to the antibiotic. And, and this is a, a common misconception which we need to clarify and make sure that we know it's, we're talking about the bacteria can no longer be killed by antibiotics. <clears throat> 
So in terms of antibiotic resistance, how does it happen? So it starts off where you're treating a population of bacteria, and we're talking about millions or billions of bacteria with an antibiotic, and a few of them, you know, only a couple within that population of a billion may be resistant to the antibiotic. So most of the, the bacteria that are susceptible get killed off, and if you're fortunate enough, your body takes over and kills the, the few remaining bacteria. But if you're unlucky, those resistant bacteria survive, multiply, have conditions that allow them to take over and become the dominant bacteria, and now they are able to transfer that resistance to other bacteria and cause drug-resistant infections. So how is resistance arising? That the main cause of resistance is the overuse of antibiotics. So we're misusing this precious resource of antibiotics, which are one of the few drugs that actually saves your life and doesn't just treat the symptoms or, or prolong your life. One of the main uh, misuses of antibiotics is in animals. So globally, about two-thirds of antibiotics aren't even used for humans, they're used to treat animals. And often they're not used to treat an infection in the animal, they're used to, uh, as a growth additive to help animals grow faster. So of that remaining one-third of antibiotics used in humans, about two-thirds of those antibiotics used in humans are used unnecessarily. So they're used to treat things like flus caused by viruses where the antibiotics actually have no effect. So if you look at, for example, this is a heat map of prescription rates in, in the UK, um, where green is, is using not so much antibiotic per person and red is using a lot more antibiotics per person. You can see that there, there are huge variations depending on what part of the country you live in. And that shouldn't happen. You know, there shouldn't be these large variations in how many antibiotics are being prescribed. And it's even more striking if you compare the number of antibiotics being used in the, the English summer versus the English winter. And winter, obviously, is a time of colds and flus, which aren't able to be treated by antibiotics, but people are being prescribed them anyway, because either they go to the doctor and demand some kind of treatment, or the um, uh, demand treatment, or the doctor prescribes them just in case the patient needs to have an antibiotic. And so this huge disparity in, in difference in the antibiotic usage and overuse of antibiotics is what is helping to drive antibiotic resistance. So obviously, yeah, you don't need antibiotics to treat viral infections. So in Australia, we're actually pretty good in terms of the use of antibiotics in animals. So we're one of the, the lowest usage countries in the world for using antibiotics in animals. But unfortunately, we're one of the highest users of antibiotics in humans. So we're using an excessive amount, um, you know, the, the estimate is one in two of you have any, had an antibiotic in the past year. So antibiotic resistance is nothing new. Every single antibiotic that's been introduced into the clinic has had resistance develop. And that's from the, the very first antibiotic, penicillin, to the more recently approved antibiotics, daptomycin and ceftaroline. So even before penicillin was used, resistance was detected. So given that antibiotic resistance is nothing new, and every antibiotic has developed resistance, why is it becoming a problem now? The reason is we're in this constant arms race against the bacteria. So we develop a new antibiotic, the bacteria evolve, develop resistance mechanisms, we come up with a new and improved antibiotic that's able to treat that resistant bacteria. And in the past, we were developing lots of new antibiotics. And unfortunately, the pace at which we're developing new antibiotics is no longer keeping up with the pace at which the bacteria are evolving new mechanisms of resistance. And so this has led to what's been called an antibiotic void. So this is looking at the discovery of completely novel classes of antibiotics. So antibiotics acting by new mechanisms by which um, haven't been developed before. And there's this huge void since the 1980s where we have not discovered and taken all the way through into the clinical use a new class of antibiotics. So there, there are two main classes of antibiotics, gram-positive and gram-negative. The gram-negative are have an extra outer membrane and are more difficult to treat. And for those, there's been a 55-year gap in terms of discovering a new class of antibiotics that's made it all the way into the clinic. So this has led to what's been called a perfect storm. So you've got this increase in the number of drug-resistant bacteria coupled with a sharp decline in the number of new antibiotics being discovered every year. So from about uh, you know, 15 to 20 per year in the 1990s down to only two or three per year left now. 
and that's largely driven by the exit of almost all major pharmaceutical companies from antibiotic research. So back in the 1990s, there are close to 20 major pharma companies that were doing fundamental antibiotic discovery. There are only two or three or four now, depending on how you classify it, that are doing basic fundamental antibiotic discovery research. And the reason for that is largely economic. So they're businesses, they need to be able to make a profit to return back to their shareholders. These are figures for new drug sales for two of the most popular new antibiotics um, for the first two years of sales. So Teflaro and Avicaz made 50 million and 80 million each in their first two years of commercial sales. You compare that to other classes of antibiotics. So Lyrica, which is, has a variety of uses, 1.3 billion. And Genuvia for diabetes, 1.4 billion. So if you're a pharmaceutical company, it costs the same amount to develop these other different types and classes of, of, of drugs. So why would you be investing in antibiotic research when you can make so much more money from other drugs? And one of the reasons in that uh, pricing disparity is the ability to charge uh, for the, the therapeutic treatment. So antibiotics, the newest, best, most advanced new antibiotic, you're lucky if you can charge more than about $1,000 a day. And antibiotics you generally take for one or two weeks, then you're cured, you don't need to take them anymore. So you're looking at maybe $15,000 for a, a, the best new antibiotic, and that's what the market is willing to pay. In contrast, the newest anti-cancer therapy that was just recently approved, a CAR-T therapy, is charging up to close to 500,000 US for one patient, for one treatment. And so for some reason, the market will allow you to pay that much for an anti-cancer drug, but it won't allow you to pay more for a new antibiotic. And this is reflected now in the clinical pipeline, so the number of new drugs being developed. So anti-cancer, anti-oncology drugs, there are over 800 of them in the stages of clinical testing, so in, in human clinical trials. And you compare that to the antibiotic pipeline, in 2015, there are 43. And so there's this huge disparity in the number of new antibiotics being developed. So if you look at the drug discovery pipeline, it takes a long time to develop a new drug. So from the, the time of initial discovery, all the way through development and then the three stages of, of human clinical testing. So phase one, you're looking for safety. Phase two, you're looking for the first signs of efficacy in maybe 100 people. And then phase three, you're doing large scale efficacy testing in thousands of patients. You know, that process takes five to 10 years. And this is why it's critical that we invest in antibiotic research now because the actual drug that will become an antibiotic is 10 to 15 years down the road. So if you look at, oh, sorry, the other thing I want to point out is that this is a, a funnel-shaped pipeline. So you start off with thousands of possible compounds. By the time you get into clinical trials, you're down to you know, 10 compounds. And there's about a 50% attrition rate through these three, phase, three stages of clinical testing that ends up with your, your one approved medicine. So if you look and, and go back to the anti-cancer drug pipeline, you see this typical funnel shape. So you've got a lot of compounds in phase one, you get some attrition, then fewer compounds in phase two, and even fewer compounds in phase three. And those will lead to you know, a few, in this case, maybe 50 or 100 new oncology drugs eventually approved. And you compare that to the antibiotic pipeline, it's almost a reverse curve. And so these are the compounds which in 10 to 15 years are going to become the next antibiotic. And so if you look at this and assume a 50% attrition rate, you know, you've got two or three new antibiotics that are going to end up as drugs five years down the road. And, and this is why we need to be doing something now to, to fill this up again so we get a lot of candidates that we can take through and produce as clinically useful drugs. So going back to this perfect storm, we need to come up with new approaches to try to reinvigorate the antibiotic pipeline. So, how do we do it? How do we discover new antibiotics? So there are a number of different approaches you can take. The, the approach that's been the most successful for probably the last 50 years is to rationally improve an existing class of antibiotics. So this is why we have fifth or sixth generation beta-lactam antibiotics or fluoroquinolones, is that you can take an existing antibiotic that bacteria have become resistant to and design it so you can make it more potent or overcome resistance mechanisms. Another possible approach is to rediscover old antibiotics. So back in the 1950s and 60s was called the, the golden age of antibiotic discovery, and there are literally thousands of new antibiotics discovered, mainly from natural product research, so isolated from other bacteria or plants or other organisms. 
And because there are so many potential antibiotics at the time, only some of those were taken forward and developed as, as clinically used antibiotics. So if you go back to literature, it's possible you can identify these golden nuggets of undiscovered antibiotics and take them forward now and develop them. Um, you can repurpose old drugs, so there are some drugs used for other indications which have been found to have antimicrobial activity. Um, you can try doing target-based approaches. So this is something that the, the pharmaceutical companies tried extensively in the 1980s and 90s. So identifying specific targets within bacteria um, based on genomic sequencing, you can identify a lot which are very different from the targets found in humans. So theoretically, you should be able to specifically target the bacteria. And while they were able to find lots of exquisitely potent inhibitors of the isolated targets, when you go to try treating the whole bacteria, the problem is the bacteria have all these other mechanisms of resistance that even stop the drug from getting to its target to begin with. So, you know, the pharmaceutical companies were spectacularly unsuccessful in their attempts to use target-based approaches to develop antibiotics. And then you can go back to how antibiotics were originally discovered uh, through trying to discover untested chemical diversity. And again, the most antibiotics were discovered as natural products and there's been a concerted effort to return to natural product discovery using more modern techniques of genomic mining, trying to use extremophile bacteria, growing bacteria under different conditions where you're able to force them to produce the metabolites that are potential antibiotics. And another source, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly later, is there is also potentially uh, antibiotics contained within synthetic chemical diversity, so compounds that chemists have made over the past 50 to 100 years. So I'm briefly going to go over a couple of different approaches that we're using at, at, in our labs at UQ trying to develop antibiotics, focusing first on an approach where we're trying to rationally approve an existing antibiotic. So if you go back to this development of resistance timeline, there are a couple of exceptions of antibiotics where it's been quite a long time when they're first introduced between significant resistance being detected. And one of these is vancomycin. So if you're looking at trying to regenerate an old antibiotic, choosing one that's taken a long time for resistance to develop seems to be a logical place to start. So vancomycin is active against gram-positive bacteria. So gram-negative bacteria have this extra outer membrane that stops vancomycin from, from getting to its target and inhibits what's called peptidoglycan by binding to a, a precursor called lipid-2, which is contained within the membrane, the outer membrane of gram-positive bacteria. And peptidoglycan forms a structural cell wall of bacteria, and so if you prevent its formation, the bacteria eventually lice open because they don't have any structure containing their contents anymore. So vancomycin binds specifically to this component of lipid-2, and our idea to try to improve the activity of vancomycin is to add on some extra components to it to selectively target it specifically to gram-positive bacterial membranes. So we add on this positively charged motif, which forms electrostatic interactions with the overall negative charge of a gram-positive bacteria. And we have this hydrophobic group, which is designed to insert into the membrane. So now we have this membrane anchoring component that helps increase the affinity for vancomycin close to where its natural target, lipid-2, lies. So this is the overall structure of the types of compounds we're making. So, so here's the vancomycin component. We attach a linker, we attach on our, our positively charged element, and then we attach on our hydrophobic group. And varying these three components, we've made, looked at over 300 different combinations and come up with some very potent analogs. So this is measuring the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, the concentration at which bacterial growth is inhibited. And these are our three lead compounds comparing against a bunch of clinically used antibiotics, so vancomycin, oxacillin, linalza, daptomycin, dalbavancin, ticoplanin, and telavancin. And against staph aureus, a methicillin resistant, this is known as golden staph, our compounds have significantly greater potency than any of these other antibiotics. And they retain that potency if you add in 50% human serum, which reflects the testing of a compound in blood where an antibiotic actually needs to work. Um, they also retain good activity against these glycopeptide and daptomycin resistant strains, so they're active against these resistant bacteria. And they're also very active against multidrug resistant strep pneumonia, which causes mainly lung infections. And they retain that activity in the presence of lung surfactant where an antibiotic like daptomycin gets inactivated, so an MIC goes from one to, to greater than eight. Um, whereas our compounds are, are very, very potent at 
inhibiting the growth of these bacteria as well. One thing that's really important in developing a new antibiotic is you want to make sure it doesn't develop resistance quickly. And there are two measurements you use to detect that. So one measures the innate resistance, so the number of bacteria in a, in a large population that already have some resistance to your new antibiotic. And basically, you want to see a number around 10 to the minus 10, which means 1 in 10 billion bacteria already have some resistance. And so our compounds um, pass that test. The other type of test is induced resistance. So if you expose bacteria to sublethal but increasing concentrations of your antibiotic over a long period of time, how quickly do the bacteria evolve over multiple generations and, and mutate to develop resistance? And you can see with, again, clinically used antibiotics, um, you've got vancomycin in the purple and daptomycin in the red. There's this gradual creep over 20 days that really reflects what you see in the clinic. And with our compounds, they're much more potent to begin with, and you see a little bit of an increase, but overall, they still at a level where we can still um, effectively treat them. In terms of antibiotic development, you have to show activity in vivo, and we use a mouse model of infection um, called a thigh infection model, where you inject a fixed concentration of bacteria into the thigh, then treat that mouse with your antibiotic. Um, so this is the, the number of bacteria in the thigh at the time you start treating with the antibiotic. If you don't use antibiotic, you get this large increase after 24 hours in the number of bacteria present. And this is comparing, again, uh, vancomycin, linalazid, and daptomycin, which are clinically used, with our two lead compounds at a fixed concentration of, of 10 mg per cake. So under those conditions, vancomycin, linalazid don't show any efficacy, and our compounds are as good or better than daptomycin. And even more strikingly, if you take this compound, vancapsin B, and do a dose response, so test at different types of concentrations. Um, now we have a positive control of vancomycin at a very high concentration, 200 mg per cake, um, and our dose at 25 and even 10 mg per cake is as efficacious as vancomycin at tenfold higher. And we're still seeing signs of efficacy at dose as low as 2.5 mg per cake. Um, the other really important thing to evaluate for antibiotics is that they do cause toxicity. And most antibiotics, or a lot of antibiotics, cause damage to the kidney um, called nephrotoxicity. So in this study, we were dosing uh, mice for seven days with a high concentration of our antibiotic and comparing it to vancomycin at a high concentration. And with the vancomycin, you start seeing all this damage to the kidney um, where you see this, this expansion or tubular dilation and this uh, infiltration of cells into the um, tubular, the tubules that, that excrete the urine out of the kidney. Whereas with our compound, dose that, uh, again, tenfold higher than its efficacious dose, um, you're seeing no effects on the toxicity. So we've got a, you know, a really promising compound which is at a stage of what we call formal preclinical development. So the, the biggest problem with taking it forward is that we need to find a commercial partner who would be interested in developing a new gram-positive antibiotic. Uh, the other program that I'm going to touch on really quickly is a program where we're trying to discover new antibiotics from untested chemical diversity. So antibiotics occupy a different physical chemical space from most other drugs. So it, the, the small dots in gray are approved drugs, and you can see that they occupy, um, if you look at log D and molecular weight, so log D is a measure of how greasy the compounds are, and molecular weight gives you an idea of how big the compounds are. So most drugs occupy this space, and this is where pharmaceutical companies are developing all their new compounds. They're really focused on designing compounds to fit into this space. But if you look at the properties of antibiotics, they're very different from most other drugs. They occupy space out here, particularly for gram-negative antibiotics, which are, are the ones in red. And this is highlighted if you look at commercial collections of compounds in terms of, of screening libraries to identify new drugs, these are a couple hundred thousand compounds contained within a, a corporate library and a commercially so-called diverse set. And you can see that it fits into a really narrow amount of chemical space. Whereas if you search in the literature for an, uh, academic compounds with reported antimicrobial activity, a much greater diversity. And so in terms of trying to discover new antibiotics, if you're searching here, you're gonna miss out on all these other potentially active compounds. So, COAD, the Community for Open Antimicrobial Drug Discovery, is a global initiative where we're trying to discover new antibiotics. And we seek diverse chemistry from academic chemists around the world, 
And we do this by offering free screening and testing against five bacteria and two fungi. And the reason we're able to do this is we had significant funding from the Wellcome Trust and support from UQ in order to offer this service for free. And so we have a website. We try to make it as easy as possible to submit compounds. Um, you can click on, pull up a submission form. In terms of, of, of um, legal requirements, we've got a software license-like terms and conditions button you just need to click on. You don't have to have a formal uh, MTA agreement. And so we get compounds in, um, we dissolve them up, we reformat them into a, a high throughput 3D4 well plate, uh, we add our solution of bacteria or fungi along with the compound, we incubate for 24 hours, and then we use optical density. So if the bacteria still grow, it becomes turbid. If the compound inhibits the growth, it, the well remains clear, and you can pick that out when you do the data analysis we then generate a report, send the data back to the collaborator, and they can do whatever they want with that data. So we have no ownership of the compound. They can publish, they can develop it, they can do whatever they want. So it's been highly successful. In um, the last three years, over 200 groups from 43 countries screened over 200,000 compounds and identified over 1,000 uh, hits so far. Um, of the hits that we've identified, they are um, largely fungal hits followed by gram positives, and then a much lower hit rate against gram negatives, which is consistent with what's been reported previously. But we do note that our hit rates are over tenfold higher from these academic collections than from the commercial drug-like bias collections. So we think that you know, we've got a good chance of identifying exciting new antibiotics. And, and where we think we fit is you have these collections of compounds, you have these initiatives which are now designed to take validated compounds forward as antibiotic drugs, and we think we fit this missing piece of the puzzle to identify antibiotics from these collections and give them enough validation that they can be developed as antibiotics by these other entities. So just to finish off, uh, there are other approaches in antibiotics to fight antimicrobial resistance. So vaccination, there are a lot of effort into developing new vaccines to prevent you from getting an infection. Um, there are so-called resistance breakers where you're looking at adding things along with antibiotics to help them overcome resistance. Um, there's phage therapy, which is something developed in, in Eastern Europe in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, which is undergoing a renaissance now. Um, my colleague Matt is going to be talking about the ability to do immune system modulation. And you can also do manipulation of the microbiome, uh, which is an emerging and, and very potentially positive field. And I'm just going to finish off with uh, what I think is a very inspirational uh, video about why we're trying to discover new antibiotics. It started as a sore throat and led to the loss of all four of my limbs. A bacterial infection caused my body to go into toxic shock. I had to explain to my 39-year-old husband, after three weeks in a coma, that he had had all his limbs amputated and only had a 1% chance of survival. Matthew is one of the lucky ones. There are many that don't make it. It is easy to listen to the statistics, the numbers and the probabilities, but Matthew is one of those human faces behind those numbers. Any one of us, or those that we love, could be one of those numbers at any time. We hope that everyone around the world can continue the simple things in life that we take for granted. To play music, to kick a ball, to walk your daughter down the aisle, or to hug someone, but simply just to be able to hold hands. The achievements of modern medicine are put at risk by drug-resistant bacteria. Without effective antibiotics for the prevention and treatment of drug-resistant bacteria, anyone who gets a bacterial infection, be it from a sore throat, a scratch, or having to go to hospital for surgery, hip or knee replacements, simple things that happen to us, is at risk from dying from a bacterial infection. <laughs>
Matt is, is a very inspirational speaker and, and does give public lectures every now and then. So if you ever get a chance to see him, um, he's got a website called Renovating Matt. Um, you know, I encourage you to, to see him talk because he's inspirational. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to my colleague. talk amongst yourselves. We're going to bring in our second expert here. Could be a computer virus, I guess. <laughs> Tough crowd. All right. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Um, powerful presentation, a powerful video to finish. Uh, to follow on from that, we'd now like to introduce Professor Matt Sweet, who is an immunologist and cell biologist, also at the, at the Centre for Inflammation and Disease Research, also at UQ. And he studies cells of the immune system and their involvement in infectious and inflammatory diseases and developing non-antibiotic alternatives for the treatment of uh, drug-resistant bacterial infections. So could you please welcome Matt Sweet. So thanks very much. Am I on? Yep. Thanks very much. It's great to have the opportunity to, to present here tonight. It's um it's wonderful. So um, um it's a bit of a hard act to follow that last video, but I'm going to, as uh, Joel mentioned, tell you a little bit about our work, which is aimed at trying to manipulate the immune system as an alternative to antibiotics. So that this is the title of my talk, and I guess I'd like to start by saying that hopefully the majority of you in the audience tonight are feeling relatively happy and healthy and are not struck down by some lurgy. And the reason, uh, if that's the case, that you're not struck down by some lurgy is that despite the fact that we're constantly bombarded by microorganisms that could potentially infect us and cause us harm, we have a very active immune system that defends us against infection. And you can see that here, that each one of you in the audience uh, coursing through your, uh, <coughs> your blood vessels and capillaries are immune cells, white blood cells, and this is a particular population of white blood cells that you can see tracking along a capillary that's searching for signs of danger, and if that cell detects danger, it responds to defend you against infection. <clears throat> and so the immune system is a very uh, powerful mechanism or powerful system that defends us against infection. And we have, of course, white blood cells that you can see there circulating, but in fact, every tissue in our body has cells of the immune system that uh, are sensing danger and responding to infection in order to protect us. So whereas the immune system is very powerful at defending us against infectious diseases, the immune system is also uh, very powerful at causing disease or driving disease pathology. And so what you can see here are a number of diseases that are common uh, in the global community. Uh, for example, autoimmune diseases like arthritis, uh, inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, for example, uh, various cancers, and the list goes on. And all of these are, diseases are connected in that the immune system plays a fundamental role in driving disease processes in these uh, typically chronic conditions and also acute inflammatory diseases as well. So uh, the immune system uh, uh, can be considered as all powerful. So uh, my wife and I actually have a small dog and, and that dog uh, kind of runs our household and she's trained her two human beings very well. So uh, if a dog can train two humans, you'd kind of hope that it's possible to train the immune system. And, Fortunately, uh, that's the case. Uh, we've, um, uh, for many years, had vaccines that have been developed that protect us from infectious diseases and, and, and even some cancers. And vaccines use the fact that our immune system has memory. So when we have a vaccination, if we then become infected uh, years down the track with a very specific pathogen that we were vaccinated against, our immune system can remember that that pathogen and mount a much more rapid response and much more effective response and deal with the infection before it can take hold and before we even realize it. And so vaccines have been very effective for all sorts of infections, though not all. And another, uh, I guess, more recent advancement in manipulating or training the immune system is immunotherapy. Uh, and this is uh, very exciting uh, in, in at least some types of cancer and for, for a subset of patients in various cancers. 
And uh, there's a particular type of immunotherapy that involves what's called checkpoint inhibitors. And in this immunotherapy, uh, essentially, cancer cells have the capacity to turn off the immune system. And so they're putting a break on the immune system. And there are certain types of immune cells that are actually very effective at killing cancer cells. So if we can remove the break on the cancer cells, that unleashes the immune system to kill the cancer cell. And so that's been uh, an area of, uh, of, uh, that's really been quite revolutionary in terms of cancer therapy, at least for some cancers. So in these cases, vaccination and immunotherapy, uh, what we're doing here is training a particular component of the immune system called the adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system is part of the immune system that has this exquisite specificity and has this capacity to remember. But there's another component of the immune system called the innate immune system. And this part of the innate immune system is particularly, uh, in many respects, the part of the immune system that's the all-powerful component of the immune system that does damage to the host, to our cells, when we have various diseases, and also is very effective at killing infectious microorganisms. And in this case, uh, you know, one opportunity would be to try and train the innate immune system and to use this power of the innate immune system for infection control. And in the context of superbugs, uh, bacteria where we have antibiotic resistance and different types of bacteria, one uh, um, advantage of trying to train the innate immune system is that in this case, the innate immune system is actually non-specific. So if we can activate it in the right way, we can potentially uh, use that system to kill different types of infection irrespective of what the, the causative agent is. So innate immunity uh, is a component of our immune system that consists of soluble factors, for example, specific proteins in our blood, and cellular components, so specific types of white blood cells that, occupy, that, that circulate in our blood as well, but also uh, can exist in various locations in, in our bodies and different tissues. And the innate immune system becomes activated when it senses danger. And so that danger could be, for example, uh, if I bang my thumb with a hammer or I cut myself with a knife in the kitchen or I get an infection, all of those situations will trigger activation of the innate immune system. And when the innate immune system is activated, there are various phases or, or, or processes that are initiated by the innate immune system to try and uh, essentially return our bodies to normal. So we're returning the system to homeostasis. And one of the components of innate immunity that's activated is a series of pathways that are designed to, to destroy invading microorganisms. So the innate immune system unleashes pathways to kill microorganisms. And it's this aspect of innate immunity that we're interested in. So one particular cell type of the innate immune system is a cell called the macrophage. And macrophage literally means big eater, macro, big, phage, eater. So they're kind of a cellular equivalent to me. And this is a picture of a macrophage here. And so macrophages exist in every tissue in our body, and they are innate immune sentinels that can detect danger, for example, in the form of infection, and they respond to that danger. So they're able to take up particulate matter, like microorganisms, and essentially degrade them. Much like having a meal, if I eat something and uh, <coughs> that meal gets uh, uh, subjected to acid in my stomach and then degraded by digestive enzymes, macrophages actually use a fairly similar process to take up microorganisms and target them for destruction. And they use a number of different antimicrobial pathways to do that, not, not just the sort of acid digestion process. So you would think that these cells are really uh, important cells of the innate immune system in defending us against infection, and indeed that's the case. But in fact, all of these different um, uh, pathogens that are highlighted here, whether they're bacterial or viral or parasitic or fungal in nature, share one common feature. And that feature is that they can actually survive in this particular cell type that's shown here. So they can evade macrophages' ability to kill them and survive in these cells. And the advantage for the, for the pathogen, the microorganism, is that these are long-lived cells. So it gives a, a nice strategy for all of these microbes to evade the immune defense system and hide out within the macrophage. And this list is by no means exhaustive. There are lots of other pathogens that use the same strategy. And some of those will be probably quite familiar to you. For example, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, or TB, that infects one third of the world's population and is responsible still for significant um, amount of mortalities worldwide. So it's in the top 10 global killers. So in many respects, even though macrophages are important in defending us against uh, infection, we could also potentially think of them as the weakest link in, in many infectious diseases. 
So uh, if there's a weakest link, it makes sense to try and boost that weakest link. And that's uh, partly the strategy that we're going with. So this video here is my attempt to demonstrate that to you in another way. So what you see here is a pathogen. And this is uh, the host. So we could consider this a macrophage. And you can see this sword here is the sort of antimicrobial response of the macrophage. And what you'll see is that the pathogen, of course, does battle with the macrophage. And it's able to disable the macrophage killing machines. Or mechanisms. And so what we seek to understand is are there other ways of turning on the macrophage, bringing out the heavy artillery to try and kill the pathogen. So you can see that's kind of our main goal. So that's always the highlight of my talk, and it's downhill from here, sadly. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to point out that uh, this movie was actually made uh, quite a few years ago by two young boys, Jean-Luc and Zach Denoir, who, were, who are now much older, actually. And uh, I, it was unbeknownst to me at the time, but I'm still paying off royalties for the making of that movie years and years later. So uh, I like to think that occasionally I have a good idea, but I don't think it's the case that I've ever had an original idea. And so this um, idea of trying to harness innate immunity is, is actually being thought of long before. And so this uh, person here is a, a famous Russian biologist by the name of Eli Mechnikov. And in the late 1800s, he actually discovered this process called phagocytosis, where cells like macrophages could take up microorganisms and target them for destruction. He was actually studying starfish larvae when he made this discovery. And he could see by stabbing them with a rose thorn that cells could be recruited and eat the, the microbes that were associated with the rose thorn. So he discovered this process, and he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1908 for that discovery. And so he was really the founder of our understanding of innate immunity. And I kind of, I guess, mention him because, in fact, he had two wives, and not at the same time, but both of those wives died from infectious diseases. And so Eli Meshnikov was living in a pre-antibiotic era, and as Mark has highlighted, we're in danger of returning that to that era. Now, at the same time as Eli Meshnikov was making these fundamental discoveries, understanding this process of innate immunity, there was a New York physician by the name of William Coley, and he's shown here. And he noted in case studies that certain t uh, for, for certain patients that had really severe, cancer, uh, severe infections of a particular type, that sometimes uh, it appeared that uh, those patients with, uh, with, with late-stage cancers went into remission spontaneously. And he was interested in trying to understand whether you could actually use infection or, or bacterial products from the infection to treat cancer patients. And, uh, and so he sort of actually was really the founder of trying to use the idea of manipulating the innate immune system uh, for therapeutic benefit in, in, in human patients. Um, and the product that he used were, was, were called Coley's toxins. It's debatable how successful they were, um, but certainly um, uh, the, the idea that uh, serious infection could sometimes have beneficial effects on cancer patients with, with serious tumours, um, there, there was some uh, substantial evidence for. Uh, of course, the risk is that you would also die from the infection. So, in terms of trying to then train the innate immune system, there's actually dual reasons why you might want to do that in the context of an infection. So if you have uh, an infection, a uh, bacterial infection, as, as Mark just highlighted to you, uh, in severe bacterial infections like severe sepsis, uh, the systemic infection that occurs triggers a hyperinflammatory response and your own immune system gets overly activated. And in fact, much of the morbidity, uh, so the, the, the damage that is done to the patient, is actually driven by the, our own immune system. And so we have uh, immune pathology as a result of this hyper-inflammatory response that our immune system is triggering. It's trying to deal with the infection, but responds in an excessive way, and it ends up doing more harm than good. And so uh, what we have in serious infections like sepsis is morbidity and mortality that's driven not just by the infection, but also by... Uh, very importantly, by the immune system driving the disease pathology. And so the idea is if we can potentially reprogram innate immunity, we can potentially target the microorganism so that we're training the innate immune system to kill the microbe, but also potentially manipulating the immune response so that we can actually dampen down the inflammatory response to suppress that as well. So the idea is that we can potentially target two aspects of uh, severe bacterial infections. So how does innate immunity fight infections? So <clears throat> one mechanism by which the innate immune system uh, deals or responds when it, when it senses danger is to sense something that shouldn't be there. 
And you might think that this is a person in an aeroplane sensing a giraffe that shouldn't be there. I like to think of it as a giraffe uh, sensing a low-flying aeroplane that shouldn't be there. But whichever way you look at it, um, the innate immune system uses a similar process. So cells of the innate immune system, like macrophages, are able to sense via various receptors that are present on their cell surface or within the macrophage, uh, different types of microorganism, for example, a bacterial pathogen, and they can sense different components. Uh, Mark was talking about cell wall components a little while ago, and this activates the macrophage, uh, and this is one family of receptors called the toll-like receptors that sense bacterial products. And the recognition uh, of microorganisms uh, in places where they shouldn't be activates the macrophages to turn on various genes that have antimicrobial functions. And so this is a major mechanism of, of activation of innate immunity, and we essentially are trying to understand these inducible antimicrobial responses of the innate immune system. So if we're to try and manipulate or train the innate immune system as a way to uh, tackle infectious diseases, we first need to actually understand the innate immune pathways. And remarkably, even though Eli Mechnikov discovered this process of phagocytosis, macrophages taking up bacteria more than 100 years ago, we're still uncovering fundamental uh, pathways that are actually used by macrophages to kill pathogens. And so this is just an example to show you uh, work from my lab and, and various other labs at the University of Queensland and indeed internationally in the last few years have shown that macrophages and other cells of the innate immune system actually uh, traffic different metal ions so that they deliver toxic concentrations of metal ions to ingested microorganisms and toxify them by metal ion poisoning. So that's kind of weird to think about, but that could be happening in your body as you, as you have an infection. So this is just to demonstrate to you that what you see here is the nucleus of a human macrophage, shown in blue, so this is kind of the brain of the cell. In, in green, you can see a bacteria within the macrophage, so it's taken up the bacteria. And in red, you can see that it's delivering toxic levels of zinc to the, bacteri uh, to the bacteria within the macrophage to try and toxify that bacterium. And this is a non-pathogenic bacterium, so it doesn't have any ways of evading the immune system. If we do the same experiment with a pathogenic bacterium, but now it's actually very closely related to this one, we can still see the bacterium in the macrophage, but now this zinc toxicity pathway hasn't been turned on. And it turns out that this ability of pathogenic bacteria that hang out in macrophages, uh, uh, or to survive in macrophages, is partly reflects their ability uh, at least in many cases, to avoid this intoxication by zinc and metal ions. And so this is an example where we could potentially manipulate metal ion concentrations if we un understand enough about the system to de develop antimicrobial approaches. So in this particular case, this is actually fairly early days. Um, as I said, there are several groups working on this particular pathway, but we still don't have a great understanding of the actual ways that our own innate immune system uh, manipulates these metal ions, but once we do, we could potentially meddle with metals to try and promote host defense against infectious diseases. <clears throat> so that's a, an example where we're still in the, pro, in, in the phase of sort of fundamental knowledge advancement, discovery to understand the system before we can do something about it. But of course, there are other um, uh, avenues where we can explore when we know uh, much more about the pathways. So, that metal ion toxicity, toxicity pathway that I just described to you is, some, is a situation where we're, uh, uh, labs are just discovering the pathway. But if we get to a point where we understand what controls the pathway, we can then potentially manipulate the pathway in the context of innate immunity. So we can switch on innate immune cells so that they become better at producing uh, antimicrobial responses to deal with an infection. And so this is just a demonstration to you of that. This is a different pathway that we've been working on that we've been... Uh, uncovering, and in this case, we're a lot further along. So we've been able to figure out what controls the pathway, and in particular, a, a specific break that turns the pathway off. So we can stop that break, we can enable the macrophages to become much better at killing the intracellular infection. And so what you see here is actually mice which have been infected with a particular bacterial pathogen, and we can see in the livers and the spleen, so in different organs of the mice, that the bacteria are replicating. So each one of these represents the number of bacteria that are present in the organs of an individual mouse. And now if we treat those mice 
with an agent that reprograms the innate immune system so that we turn on one of the macrophage antimicrobial pathways, now what you see that in those mice, the vast majority of the mice, we can't detect back, uh, that bacterial pathogen in those organs. So they've uh, been successful in dealing with the infection and, and uh, if not always clearing the, the infection, uh, in, in, in most cases clearing it or reducing bacterial loads. So that's an example of uh, being further along so that we can uh, understand the pathway and then manipulate it to essentially train the innate immune system to deal with pathogens. So <clears throat> Mark described to you the many issues that exist with the antibiotic pipeline, the generation of new antibiotics and the, the pitfalls that exist. Fortunately, people like Mark and other people around the world are tackling this problem by developing um, antibiotics through various approaches. Uh, but, of course, there are other ways that we can tackle um, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacterial pathogens. What I've tried to describe to you very briefly uh, in a, is an overview of how we can potentially boost the innate immune system cells like macrophages so they become much more equipped to deal with an infection. So when we have an infection, we can treat not to kill the pathogen directly, but to activate our innate immune system so that we boost a particular antimicrobial response to kill the pathogen. Other people are uh, tackling this issue in, in related ways. So, for example, um, uh, when, when cells like macrophages kill pathogens, they do so by pre, uh, producing various molecules that have antimicrobial activity against the pathogen. And so some people are identifying the end products of, of the antimicrobial response and using that as a, a way to potentially treat bacterial infections. Another strategy is to try and kill the infected immune cell. As I mentioned, many types of pathogens actually survive within macrophages or other cell types. And if one could selectively kill an infected cell, you would then expose the microbe to the extracellular environment such that it could be dealt with by the rest of the immune system. And that's also a very attractive approach that a number of people are taking in experimental systems at least. And it shows great promise in, uh, in experimental avenues. And I guess uh, just to highlight to you that all of these approaches uh, to try and treat an infection, so you have an infection, you are uh, trying to manipulate the response so that you're clearing the infection, but of course prevention is always better than cure, so there's uh, still very intensive es efforts with vaccination for the many pathogens in which we don't have effective vaccines, and that remains an important uh, approach and strategy in dealing with infectious diseases broad in a more broad setting. Um, so I'm going to finish there. I didn't really talk much about, uh, in any specific detail, about the work that my lab does, really, just to give you a couple of snapshots. But I did want to actually say that, uh, uh, for those of you who don't have much to do with science, science is an incredibly rewarding pursuit, but it's also a very challenging one. And these people, uh, well, not this guy, but the rest of them in my lab, are, are all incredibly dedicated people and hardworking people that are constantly trying to generate new knowledge that can potentially be used uh, for society benefit. And uh, I should also say thank you to uh, the various bodies like the NHMRC and the Australian Research Council that support our research. Uh, and all of our, my research is done at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland. And I'm uh, grateful for having uh, excellent facilities to do the work. So thank you very much all for your attention. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, we'll give you a chance to have a drink, catch your breath, and then we will take questions. So if you have questions for either Matt or for Mark, you can write them down, and Leonie will come round and grab those now, wave them in the air. And there's already a few questions coming through on Twitter, so feel free to keep posting there. Uh, next month, we are, of course, back, and we are having a speed breeding night. Uh, which is not quite as dodgy as it sounds, although it is kind of seedy. We are talking, we have Dr. Lee Hickey from UQ who is developing new strains of wheat that can be bred much more quickly, um, up to six generations annually, um, enabling new ways of breeding and creating new varieties. So if you haven't seen Lee speak before, fantastic speaker, so get along to that. Um, 
I might invite you guys to get up on the stage. Uh, final thing is, of course, hop on the website. You can sign up to the Briz Science mailing list to be kept up to date for all of these. And this talk, as well as most of our past talks, are available online. So you can uh, review this again, catch up on any of Matt's jokes that you might have missed on his slides tonight. Uh, wouldn't want to miss any of those. All right. Um, first question is from Twitter for um, Mark, which is from Lindell, who asks, what about bugs versus bugs? I've read about breeding friendly E. coli to fight superbugs on their own turf. Yeah, so this is, uh, I alluded right at the very end of the presentation towards trying to manipulate the microbiome and come up with ways of encouraging the good bacteria to predominate and, and basically crowd out the, the resistant bacteria. So, you know, it's a, a nascent field, um, which is, developing. The, the most advanced treatments are for um, a bacteria called C. difficile, which causes um, gut infections and uh, becoming a significant problem in hospitals. Um, so there's a, a treatment called fecal transplant therapy, which is not the most attractive therapy, um, but it's remarkably effective at, at treating really serious cases of, of C. diff infection where drugs aren't working and, and causing a complete um, restoration of the normal microbiota within, within the gut, which prevents the C. diff from taking over and, and causing the disease. Right. Uh, another one for you, Mark. Howard asks, how can, I, well, perhaps both of you can tackle this actually, but how can economics be modified to ensure there is no drive for manufacturers to o overuse antibiotics? Yeah. So, so, you know, here comes, here's the dichotomy of, you know, you're trying to encourage a financial reward for antibiotic developers, and as you've seen, you know, the financial market doesn't stack up in terms of what you can charge for an antibiotic. So really, the only way they can try to make money is by selling as much antibiotics as possible. And if you've developed, just developed a new fantastic antibiotic, that's diametrically opposed with what you want to do with it. You want to preserve that antibiotic and save it for the rare cases, you know, currently the rare cases where bacteria have become completely resistant. Um, so, so there is a lot of analysis going on. Um, there, there's an initiative within the European Union called the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which has a program called New Drugs for, for Bad Bugs. As part of that, they had a program trying to workshop what type of economic incentives you could develop in order to drive antibiotic development. And basically what they've come up with is a reward system um, where there's a pot of money if you get a new antibiotic approved, and, and we're talking a pot of money of like a billion or two billion dollars available that a manufacturer or a drug discoverer that, that gets a new antibiotic approved would have access to that couple billion dollars um, basically to not use the antibiotic and to preserve it for the rare cases where people do have resistant infections. So, yeah, maybe I would just also say that uh, the livestock industry is another area where, you know, antibiotic use is a huge problem and I guess uh, regulatory control is something that is another area where change can be made and I think that's a really important area that needs to... Mm -hmm. Where, where things need to happen at as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and to follow up on that though, the, you know, so for example, the, the States is a really good example where there's been very little control of antibiotic usage in animals and that's largely driven by the, the very large agricultural lobby, which mm. it doesn't even allow you to assess how many antibiotics are being used in the animals. Mm. But th there is a lot of change and that's been driven by the consumer. And so companies like McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken are using antibiotic free meat because you, the consumers, are demanding that that happens. And so, you know, that's going back up the food chain to forcing the, the food producers not to use antibiotics. And so there is, a, you mm. know, there is a way to even get around the government regulation or lack thereof. Yeah. Right. Uh, Matt, question, mm. why hasn't the immune system evolved to prevent bacteria from hiding inside macrophages? Or I guess other elements of the Yeah, so there's a constant co-evolution between the hosts, for example, us, and, and the pathogen. And so it's a constant arms battle. Uh, the, the, the pathogen always has the upper hand, however, because they, their replication rate is much more rapid than ours. And so the rate of evolution is much more rapid as well. So um, we're, uh, in many respects, uh, always playing catch up to some extent. However, having said that, um, you know, uh, most of us are actually uh, healthy most of the time. And uh, even where we have infections like, um, for example, TB, which I said is 
infects one third of the world's population, so you know, it's a major pathogen in terms of global um, significance. Uh, the majority of, of TB infections are latent infections where our immune system is controlling the infection and then it's when um, someone, their immune system becomes a bit compromised, that's when you have the problems when the, the TB infection takes, takes hold. So, yeah, so I guess uh, largely it's about the pathogen um, being able to evolve more rapidly. Uh, Nicola from Twitter asks, would restricting use now of antibiotics help to uh, curtail resistance or is it too late for existing antibiotics? <laughs> um, it's a really good question. Um, there's been increasing amount of research done uh, into things like trying to, what are the effects of recycling antibiotics? So if you, if you cycle between two different antibiotics, can you prevent the resistance or, you know, once the resistance starts, do you use another antibiotic? Does it regenerate, revert back to a, a phenotype where the other antibiotic still works? And, you Which know, is the, another question we have here, uh, can bacteria yeah, yeah. forget resistance? So, <laughs> so, so yes, to some extent, but there is a, you know, bacteria genetically carry memories of resistance on things called plasmids, which can be rapidly exchanged between bacteria. So to some extent, no, that, that won't be effective. Um, there actually was a really interesting study recently um, in, in Africa where they, without any diagnosis, um, treated children with an antibiotic um, from six months up to, to four years and gave them two doses a year um, of an antibiotic, azithromycin. Um, and that was without any diagnosis of infection. And they found that there's a reduction in the mortality rate, and this was treating 100,000 children with antibiotic and a control group where they didn't treat for another 100,000. And they found about a 13% reduction in mortality over the, the treated group. And this comes up with a real ethical dilemma because by this non-specific prescription of antibiotics, you're potentially fostering the development of antimicrobial resistance. But at the same time, you're saving literally thousands of lives by doing it. So, hmm. you know, it, it's a real dilemma. Hmm. Yeah, and I guess, uh, you know, typically, as Mark showed, the, the path to antibiotic resistance is shorter and shorter with antibiotics being developed. So, you know, the, I guess there is a need for complementary approaches. And Mark gave a number of examples of those. So, you know, there, I think uh, it's important in the future that we tackle things with not just antibiotics, but other approaches. Yeah. And, and just to, you know, the economic case, just in terms of, it's not that, you know, um, pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in, in bacterial infectious diseases. It is a matter of the economics. So, for mm. example, for vaccines, um, there's an anti-pneumonococcal vaccine called Prevnar, um, which, which has been very effective. And the company that sells it made $7 billion last year from it. And so there are a lot of companies investing in vaccines because they can make money out of it. Why is it that people are willing to pay more, or the market at least is willing to pay more for cancer vaccines versus potentially life-saving antibiotics? Will that change as people get more desperate? Uh, Mark, Mark's probably a better person to answer this than me, but I suspect that one of the reasons is partly about the, the sort of the demographics of, of the diseases. So Western world are dealing with cancer and chronic diseases. Um, and these are the major diseases um, that affect you know, us in, in Australia. Most people die of heart disease or cancer. They're the, they're the main killers. Um, infectious disease is also very significant. But you know, by comparison, those, those two broad areas are the, the major killers in, in, in Australia and in other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, in less developed countries, it's the complete reverse. So, you know, if you look at the top 10 killers, 10 killers in developed countries versus undeveloped countries, uh, there's quite significant differences. In, in, in each case, infectious diseases are important. So in, in, uh, globally, respiratory diseases, I think, are about the third biggest killer. Diarrheal diseases are, are in the top 10, as is TB. But the, uh, the contribution of, of different types of disease varies dramatically between the Western world and, and undeveloped countries. And, and sadly, I think that's probably a driver. Uh, yeah, no? like, I, I really don't know. I, you know, I think it's, it's potentially partly just a public perception that people don't realize that it's such, an, uh, such a potential issue going forward. And the fact that the majority of infections still are able to be treated by antibiotics, which are generic and, and really cost, you know, maybe $100 for a treatment. And so you're competing against those, those rarer cases that are resistant against the majority of cases which are still very, very cheap to, to treat. Mm. 
maybe a follow-up question. How likely is it that antibiotics, or perhaps alternatives, will be developed against which bacteria will be incapable of developing resistance? Are there any silver bullets? <laughs> <laughs> I would say unlikely, but I'm, I'm not the expert here. But, uh, you know, I think uh, evolution is a powerful thing and uh, the capacity to evolve, um, uh, you know, in every case in the past has, has been overcome, has overcome antibiotics. Uh, I guess combinatorial approaches may uh, reduce the chances, but uh, so if you had... Uh, a multi-acting antibiotic that was targeting lots of different pathways within the bacterium rather than just one pathway, I, I presume that might, may have a better chance, but um, uh, yeah. I think it's, it's tough. <laughs> I, I, I hate to give bacterial intelligence, but they seem to be very smart and, and <laughs> rapidly adapting. And um, part of the problem or the, or the reason why they're able to adapt is they, they reproduce so quickly. So. 20 minutes for some bacteria is their, their reproduction life cycle. So if you look at you know, the doubling time for bacteria, w within a couple of days, you've gone from a couple of bacteria to millions of bacteria. And so that ability to you know, mutation in any one of those divisions, that makes them less susceptible to an antibiotic. It's carried through and amplified really quickly. So it's a nice lead into our talk next month about <laughs> speed breeding wheat. <laughs> we want to do the same thing, but for good, right. not evil. Um, we are over time, but I just want to ask one more question, because it's a nice blunt one. Why the hell are public bodies not doing all research? That's <laughs> all this research. Um, you know, is, this, is this something that there should be more role for uh, government, for research institutes, universities, rather than private industry? Do we have to take more of a responsibility at that level? Uh, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, can you maybe elaborate? Well, I mean, to what, where do you think this sits in the future? Do we need to, is there a, creating a pipeline that we give to private companies to develop? No, okay. Or is this, you know, do we, should we be expecting that our universities, that these new drugs are going to come out of universities and we should be funding that? I, I mean, discoveries are, you know, very often made in, in universities. It's the big gap between, you know, the discovery to actually getting it to, to clinical use. It's the major issue. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I have the answers to that, but what we need is, uh, and I guess Mark highlighted that in terms of, you know, co-ed and, and efforts to try and fill the void in some ways, um, we need avenues to plug the gap between fundamental discovery and actually kind of taking that to an end product. It's a huge gap at the moment that usually requires multiple players along a long journey of many years, usually a decade or more, uh, and so it's a very significant challenge and, and usually, you know, people, at least in my case, we're, we're really about fundamental discovery and the hope that that can be then used. Uh, if, you, if you're a sort of a, a researcher, an academic researcher who wants to take a discovery and really translate it, um, you would have to take one single discovery and, and follow it for the rest of your life in, <laughs> in many instances to actually make that happen and often it won't because there's a you know, a huge failure rate in terms of actually translation. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess we need other bodies driven by government to actually plug the gap, essentially. And I, I would say 100% the government has to be doing more to support infectious disease research. So it, it's, you know, currently, you know, it's woefully underfunded compared to other disease indications. And, and part of that is, you know, the public needs to put pressure on their politicians to, to fund it because that, you know, they go where, where the money is in, and cancer therapies have, have a lot more higher profile. They've got public organizations promoting charitable donations, and, and that's where the government is investing a lot of their, their research funding into specific programs targeted towards oncology. Um, the, the new Medical Research Future Fund what was meant to be targeting infectious diseases for some of its initial funding. Um, there are a few rounds of, of relatively small amounts of money, and the new budget that this comes out doesn't mention infectious diseases at all. And so, you know, that's where the, the funding is going. We were talking about this before, but to finish, you feel optimistic, though, that we will come through and <laughs> get, get to solutions? Yeah, we should I try think, and maybe uh, finish with a slightly more upbeat note. I think, I think people, generally speaking, are, are you know, very good at finding solutions uh, to all sorts of problems in life, and I think that uh, it will be the case for, uh, for antibiotic-resistant bacteria as well. The, the, I guess the real question is, at what point 
will it, you know, will we reach a sort of catastrophic level? Where, you know, obviously it's already serious, but will it be orders of magnitude more serious before, uh, you know, funding streams are diverted to actually make things happen? So that's, I think it will happen. Just ha what the level of uh, the, the fallout in the process to get there is. Yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic. I think, you know, with a variety of different approaches, not only antibiotics, but non-antibiotic therapies, I think will develop. And, and the biggest question is, are we going to be able to do it before there is some kind of pandemic that happens, at which point it's too late to be doing anything. And so, it's, you know, it's a race against time. Well, hmm. lots of work to be done. Good to know it's in good hands. You have <laughs> lots more questions, so please join us outside. But for now, put your hands together and thank Matt and Mark for a fantastic talk this evening. And see you all back next month. Thank you.